Hello, I'm Michael Kurland, CEO and co-founder of Branded Group, an award-winning facility maintenance and construction management company that services multi-site commercial properties, such as retail, restaurants, healthcare facilities, and educational institutions. Welcome to the Be Better podcast. Each week, I interview thought leaders from a variety of industries who will share their stories and the lessons they learn as they strive to be better for their clients, partners, employees, and their community. Are you ready to be better? All right. Welcome to another episode of the Be Better podcast. I'm your host, Michael Curland. Very excited today. We have a very special guest, Michael C. Bush, the CEO of Great Place to Work. Michael, welcome on the show. Thank you for coming on. Great to be here today. Why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and uh, your background? Yeah, uh, well, today, actually, I've got a sunny, clear sky day here in Oakland, California. And uh, this is where I live. This is where I was born. This is where I was raised. Um, So been here in Oakland for for a long time. And uh, I joined Great Place to Work uh, in September of 2015. Actually, I bought the company with a partner. I was hired to sell the company and ended up buying it myself. Um, so that's very that, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a long, crazy, uh, story, but, um, one that had a really, really good outcome. Um, certainly for me, I just consider it to be, uh, an act of, of great fortune. And so, uh, been a great place to work and, uh, join the work that I love ever since then. Well, great. Again, thank you for coming on. And uh, we love everything that you've been doing at Great Place to Work. Uh, Branded Group has been on the list for three years running and hoping to make it four in the, in the coming year. So thank you for all that you've done with that. Um, we're going to get started, re- jump right into these questions. We've got a lot of good culture questions and I'm so excited to have you on, especially in this uh, crazy you know, COVID year that we're having. So the first question I have for you is, how do you make sure that your culture is more than just words on a wall? Yeah, I, I think that what we try and measure is the employee experience. Um, what are employees actually experiencing? Because uh, as you know, uh, the words on the wall can say one thing, but what are people actually experiencing on a consistent basis? So we uh, believe the best way to find out what people are experiencing is to ask them. So we basically ask uh, employees and the companies that we work with 60 questions. And we ask the same 60 questions to 10,000 companies in 150 countries around the world. So uh, while things are different in different corners of the earth, in terms of what people want from the people that they work with and the people that they work for, they are the same. So we ask questions about whether you feel respected, whether you feel like your leaders are honest with you, whether you feel that your leaders are fair and are equitable. Um, do you have a, a fair opportunity to get recognized for good work, to get rewarded for good work, to get developed and to get feedback? All the things that people want that really show them that uh, they are respected. And we ask questions about, do you enjoy the people that you work with? Uh, do you feel like the people you work with care for you? Do you care for the people you work with? And do you feel like you're really part of a team, You know, a sense of belonging that the organization just wouldn't be as good without you? Um, that you are needed there. So we ask those questions in indirect ways because we use the social science uh, template in terms of uh, having done surveys of over 100 million people. We understand how to ask these questions, how to analyze the data. Um, but the data is very accurate in letting us know what people are experiencing. Um, and then uh, it doesn't matter what's on the walls, what's on the walls, uh, the facts speak for themselves in terms of what leaders are experiencing and what they're experiencing is different from what's on the walls, then it's real clear what leaders need to do. Yeah. And I can attest to that. I mean, we, like I said, we've done your uh, participated for the last three years and we've gotten the feedback afterwards. And, you know, there's, there's definitely eye opening feedback that you you need to, you think you're doing well at certain things, whether it's uh, some employees feel like maybe they're not as respected or they're not uh, getting as much, um, uh, applause for, for their hard work. And you got to start putting that into motion so that it's not just words, words on a wall. That's right. And I, and I gotta say, like, I was so amazed. I was, I was looking over your bio and like a hundred million surveys. I mean, that is so much data. So you guys really truly are the experts. That's just, 
amazing to me, like how, how many people have participated in, and how you've, you know, quantified that. That's, that's kudos to you guys for making that happen. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's a great database and uh, it enables us to uh, let people know what's really going on. Also to give them some benchmark comparisons. And, uh, and mo most importantly these days is to predict um, what will happen if you make certain changes and to predict what will happen if you don't make certain changes. And how, how close are those predictions? How, like, how spot on, how, how much do you get into the, the, the numbers? Yeah, they're, they're very, very spot on. You know, for example, let's say exit surveys, something that a lot of companies do. Um, we don't offer an exit survey because we've never seen an exit survey that we didn't see the problems multiple years before the person exited. So um, we can look at a company right now and tell you, if people start exiting, which they're about to, let us tell you why. Um, it's something going on in your benefit. It's something going on under this leader. There's something going on in accounting and finance that isn't going on in sales and marketing. The data is very, very um, reliable in terms of letting, le letting a leader know that somehow they're losing a connection with the person. And in the open comments, for example, people start talking about a job. Whenever you see job, there's a problem. The last thing you want is a person who says, I have a job. And so you, you start to see it. You see it in the word clouds. Um, you, you, you start talking about, you start seeing people um, saying they can't wait till Friday. Um, and, you know, in, in various comments and that why isn't every day hump day? You see that in the open comments. These are signs that, that, that something's going on. And if the organization pays attention to those, um, you're actually able to see, and we have algorithms that show that these people, we actually identify them as presenteeism, meaning they're just come and they're present at work, but they're either just there to get the money or they're looking for another job or it's not a good time in their personal life. But we identify them as the flight risk because they're just present and give management things that they can do to try and change that. And if you don't, then, yeah, they will be doing an exit survey. Wow. Um, this, is, this is very fascinating to me. So with all, all this data that you've collected, what is the, like, the, the most uh, crazy thing that you've found through all the data in terms of like, what, what is an indicator that someone's unhappy or someone is happy that wouldn't be something you would typically think? Um, well, let's say that uh, a person says, I don't think that the organization or my manager cares for me as a person. If a person says that, all the alarm bells should go off. Because I can tell you right now, a person who says that also says promotions do not go to those who deserve them. Okay. They say pay is not fair. And you can say, well, how do people get paid? And they say, they will say, I don't know, but it's not fair. People's perceptions are shaped primarily by whether they feel like they're being cared for as a person. This is, this is something that people think, well, that's a soft skill. It is. It is. And it's really, really important. Uh, and the flip side of that, people will say that um, um, I haven't been promoted. I don't understand how pay works, but I feel my manager cares for me as a person. And then you say, OK, well, do you think promotions are fair? I don't really understand how they work, but I bet they're fair. That caring, that connection that somebody actually has a conversation with them, speaks to them a certain way gives them feedback, which is how you show you care, um, thanks them, um, and develops them. Um, those signs are, are what people are looking for to know if you care for them. They're not looking for a new friend. Uh, they're looking for somebody that's trying to help them build a career. They're looking for, for a sign that somebody's going to do all they can to give them the resources and feedback and information they need to advance in their job so they can do more for themselves or for their family. So care isn't a word that's used a lot, but it's a very important metric of ours. It's one of our top six me metrics. And it's the one that enables you to predict um, with, at the second highest, highest level of, of 
reliability at the most reliable level of reliability. It's trying to find out whether people feel emotionally and psychologically safe at work. That's the most reliable predictor. And it's related to care. People don't feel safe. They don't feel cared for. Um, so there is a high correlation between those two things, even though there is a subtle difference between the two. This is, again, this is fascinating. I, you know, we talk all the time as business owners, when you're not getting into the culture con conversation about ROI, and I've always not, you know, been able to explain how what we've done with our culture is not really something you can, you can ga gauge by an ROI, but it's about the emotional intelligence and making the people want to stay. And then, you know, you go into these long winded uh, explanations of, of why it, it does help your ROI kind of, you said like the soft, the soft uh, skills, right? Yeah. So anyway, this is just fascinating to me. So I'm kind of fanboying over here a little bit. But. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> but the, but the next question I do have for you, um, if you have a generational workforce, how do you get everyone to buy into the culture? How do you get them all to embrace it? Yeah. Well, the best way, you know, the, the thing that makes a culture really come together is when people feel like they're working together towards something that matters, that matters. And uh, cash flow doesn't really do it except for bankers. Um, and uh, EBITDA doesn't really do it. Y you know, it, it's something else. That's, that's an important thing. But people want to be doing something else. They want to feel like they're, they're actually making things better um, for uh, their customers um, and their community. So that's a sense of purpose. So really, uh, you know, talking about culture, it makes sense to people only if they have some context, which is why do we exist? Why are we here? You know, how, how do we actually impact the world? And um, instead of just the one, the dollar or the shareholder or the owner, it's going beyond that to multiple stakeholders. So uh, talking about purpose, then you can talk about the kind of culture that's needed to deliver on that purpose. And what you find is a purpose-driven organization, always the, reason, the culture that's needed is one where people are of service to each other. That's it. It's, it's, it's where people want to help the people that they work with, and they want to work with the people that they work with to help the customer um, and, and to help the community. So... Uh, this, this, you find this, this culture of service and selflessness of humility and curiosity, the thing that's needed and, and accountability as being the things that's needed to actually achieve that higher purpose. You don't have to have those things if it's just money. You actually don't. If you want it to be just money, um, I got the data on that too. Um, you can actually have people that are motivated on, on money um, but they don't score very well and they aren't on our list. Right. <laughs> um, we do, we do business with them, but they're not on our list. Uh, they just wonder why they're not on our list. They're not on our list because they don't have a high trust culture because when you are just about the money inside your company, you have people that are winners and losers and people telling them that. Right. You're a loser. You need to be like us. We're big game hunters. What have you done for us this quarter? Well, you actually see it in the data. These people that are having a great time and these other people that are having really a miserable time. Um, and, uh, but you find those in places that are really just driven towards, um, you know, financial rewards. Yeah, at my last place, I was the uh, vice president of sales and marketing for seven years. And we had a vice president of business development and we were pitted against each other in a competition on us for pretty much seven years. And thankfully we both had thick skin and were able to, you know, initially we were not friends. And then after the first year we became, we, we realized like what there's no reason for us to argue with each other. But when I, when I came out here and, and I started branded group, that was the one big thing. I do not pit my sales team against each other. I, I still run the sales team to this day and I do not pit them against each other because the competition just, it just breeds anger and it's not, it's not teamwork. Like you're saying, it's not culture. So when I did get out here and started the branded group, I, I really wanted to put a focus on culture and that's where the, the purpose came in the one for one program, the giving back. And that's 
To your point, I mean, I think that's part of why we've been on your list for the last three years and hopefully, you know, we'll be continuing going forward. But all of the, all of the uh, people in, in our company, they feel like they have, a, I don't know if all of them do, but a good portion of them feel like they do have yeah. a purpose. They're, they're giving back. We're serving our community. We're serving our customers. And, you know, they're, they're there to help each other. So I digress. But, you know, you just touched on a lot of points, and I feel like it makes sense we've been on your list for the last uh, couple of it, years. It does. Yeah, it's not a digression at all. That's the reason why. <laughs> so next question is, how, how do you continuously improve company culture? you guys are the company culture gurus. How, like what, yeah. you know, we, we, we set this, this culture in motion five years ago and we're constantly always trying to like uh, tweak it to make it current. And especially now with COVID it's, it's been even more difficult. So how, what, what recommendations do you have to continuously improve on company culture? Yep. Well, it's being connected to your people and, and having leaders who um, uh, are working on ways of doing that better. So it's all the number one thing that an organization needs to do is improve the behave the way that their leaders behave. So you, you, you need to have a, a data to know about the experience that your leaders are creating and every leader, including myself, I, I have things to work on. And so every leader ought to feel that way and ought to know what they're working on, what behaviors are, are they really working on? And so because you don't have to be an introvert or an extrovert um, or charismatic. You don't have to be any of those things to know how to listen, to know how to speak, to know how to thank people, to know how to give people feedback, to know how to welcome someone um, and uh, how to make sure that you're doing all those things in a fair way, regardless of, of the gender of a person or their length of time in the company or what they do in the company or their rank in the company, you're just doing those things all the time. So that's the work of the leader. And that, that work, um, when a leader's doing that well, creates a great experience for the employees. And when leaders aren't doing that well, it creates uh, you know, a, a, a lesser experience because 70% of the work experience is determined by the leader, um, you know, the person that, that you work for. So that's what's most important. And then you, you do want to have some benefits and policies and programs in place that support people like that, you know, that, that people know that, you know, I don't have kids, but I have a pet. And um, my colleagues have insurance for their kids, but I don't have one for my pet. You know, is it wouldn't be fair if I had pet insurance? Well, you know. Uh, a lot of companies like Great Place to Work, we have pet insurance that we offer through Nationwide. You know, it's not that hard to get. It's really cheap. Uh, and our people freaking love it. You know, it's like 12 bucks a month. It's, you know, and, and so it's just a little thing, but that's what fairness is. Yeah. That's what fairness is. And so if you're listening to your employees and you're connected to them, they'll let you know. You know, I love everybody who has kids. I don't have any. And by the way, I'm never going to have any. But I got a couple of pets. Oh, well, golly, maybe we ought to do something for you. So it, it's, it's looking at the leaders, making sure that they're developing, looking at your programs and policies and practices, and making sure that they are for all. That's the whole point, making sure they're for all. Whatever this benefit is, think about why you're doing it and who's not benefiting from it. And what is it that they might need? What you is know, it that they might need? That's great information. And I'm going to tell a true, honest story. I had an employee approach us a couple of years ago asking this exact question if we would offer pet insurance. And I was like, come on, like, really? We're going to offer pet insurance? But you know what? After this conversation right now, I am going to call my director of HR and we are going to offer pet insurance starting. Uh, I, I guess we can't do it till 2021, but we'll, we'll get it on the docket for 2021. That so sounds that. nice. Yeah. Yeah. Check out nationwide. Okay. We will. we will. So, so and they're on that. our list. <laughs> look at that. You're making, making things happen here. So we, we touched on COVID-19 a little bit. Uh, I really want to know how has that impacted your culture and your leadership style during this pandemic? What, what changes have had to be made on your end? Yep. So increased connection increased connection. Uh, and so um, it's, it's making sure that, that during meetings, uh, during one-on-ones, uh, you have a way of having a conversation with the people who work for you 
work with you about how they're doing and how their family's doing. Well, the only way you can know how they're doing and how their family's doing is you have to know something about their family. So um, uh, we concentrate on that. And uh, so uh, we recommend uh, to our customers, especially now, since we're going to be doing this for a while, that if you haven't done it already, nobody I know, I mean, I just talked to Chuck Robbins this morning, CEO of Cisco, 77,000 people, just had a meeting with him with 37,000 of their employees. And even if you're Chuck, you don't have more than 20 people who report to you. Most people don't have more than 20. And you can actually be connected to 20 people. Actually, you can be connected to 150 people. And so uh, 20 people is actually pretty straightforward. And so what you do is just get a book or some tool, some note thing on your, on your laptop or phone, and you say, hey, um, just wanted to you know, take a little time you know, to uh, get to know you a little bit better. Because if I get to know you a little bit better, I can improve your experience here. So I um, wanted to know if you're willing to go back and forth a little bit. Um, so let me tell you what family means to me. You know, I have a partner, I have this, and we have a person who lives with us and so on and so forth. And um, are you willing to let me know something about yours? And write it down. Because you're going to forget. You know, okay, they have two kids, they have two cats, and a mother-in-law who lives there. Um, you know, who gets dialysis to be a week. You write these things down so that you, you, you know this. And it will change every conversation you have with that person from that day forward. It will be altered. You will see them in a more human way and they will see you in a more human way. And then it's, hey, what have the eight, last eight months been like for you and your family? Okay, and as you're looking towards the holiday season, you know, as we close out this year, what are you worried about? You know, or what are you hopeful for? And then, hey, is there anything we can do? You know, I'm not saying we can do it, but I'd just like to know, is there anything that, that, we, that we can do? That's the connection that's needed now. That's the connection that's needed now. And I think, I think it kind of goes full circle back to what you started with is just being a great listener and showing them that you care. Uh, you know, we, in my sales career, I've learned the best salespeople are the ones that can listen. And as the CEO of this company, showing that you care, it just pays, like you said, it pays dividends. So I love this idea. I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to tell you now, I'm going to steal it and start having one Excellent. writing things down because this is great, great information. So next question I have for you, have, have you had to change any of your culture to adapt to the new paradigm of remote work? Obviously, besides Zoom meetings, right? Everyone's now Zoom yeah. happy or, or Google Meets or whatever. But what other things? Yeah, we've just increased the connections. That, that's all. No, nothing else. Um, because luckily, we have a high trust culture. We take our survey every three months. Oh, wow. Uh, so I get the feedback every three months. And I'm just like everybody else. Uh, it's a horrifying day because I only focus on the <laughs> stuff that's on our heat map. It's red. Um, and, and, uh, but, but we do it and we share our results with everybody in the company. So we're the only crazy company who does that. Uh, everybody has the same access that I do. They can see every open comment and then we get the results. And on Monday, um, uh, uh, next, this coming Monday will be our management team going through that data in detail while people in the company are going through it. And then we will report to the company what we think we see. There's a group that will then, uh, we call it the people posse, let us know what the people see. And then we develop our plan of action. In 90 days, what we're going to do. Wow. And so we get, we get right on it. And so um, that's what we do a great place to work because we have to because we're a great place to work. Right, and, right. Um, <laughs> um, and, but, but I, you know, so the, the last three months, what have we done? Connections. Okay, we're all over that. We're doing a, doing a good job there. Uh, we've built up our racial stamina due to the racial injustice and divide in, in the United States. Uh, we've tuned up our physical and mental health support. And really, COVID has done that along with racial injustice. And, um, um, and then our people were feeling like during this COVID experience, 
they weren't getting trained or developed. Um, and so we were like, yeah, because we're not doing it. Um, and then we were like, okay, we got two ways to go. We're not going to be doing it. And then we decided the people are asking for it. So we put a group of people together and put together a great place to work 101, 102, 103. So we're taking this time to double, pe to double down on making sure you understand our methodology. Wow. And our software platform. And so we're just doubling down on making sure, you know, you're expert at all we do. Um, things that you wouldn't normally do because maybe you're too busy or something like that. And then we just, our last survey, the people responded really, really positive to that. They were like, that was awesome. Um, and really appreciated it. And, uh, you know, we're, we're about to have something else to work on. So we definitely eat our food um, and, uh, you know, pay attention to the survey results, which is really what listening is all about. But, you know, thinking about what's guided us through the past eight months and what's going to guide us through the next eight months, it's the connections part. I like it. Uh, and you guys certainly, you have to eat your food, right? Yeah. <clears throat> we actually, I, I can relate to one thing you, you were saying in there is, uh, we do a, an annual survey internally as well. And we take all that information and same thing package it. And we just got our survey results back last Tuesday. And just like you said, all Monday, I was just like, oh my God, uh, what are we going to hear? What, what is, what's the bad stuff? And it was all good, but you know, not all good, but it was mostly good. But we fo I focused and fixated on like the three things that were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh, how can we <laughs> fix these? So we're, we're yeah. same thing. We're working on that plan of action to fix. But um, this is, this has been great, Michael. I, I really appreciated our time. I got one last question for you that we ask uh, everyone that comes on the show. Okay. That I, I'd like to ask you, what are you an expert? What do you consider yourself to be an expert at? And how would you give our audience advice on how to become an expert at said thing? Yeah, I think I'm an expert at listening. Um, and uh, because that's what people say. Um, so uh, they said it so much. Uh, Ted actually asked me to do a TED on listening, uh, wow. which I did about three years ago. And I think it's, you know, maybe got six or seven million views at this point. And uh, it's only, it's a four minutes, you know, you can, you can find it somehow. I don't know how, but um, probably Google TED and TEDx and Michael C. Bush and listening. And, um, uh, you know, I think it's, it's uh, called uh, how to have happy employees at work. It's something about happiness, but I did this little thing on listening. It became all about that little thing I did in it. Um, about uh, uh, listening for all the obvious reasons. But it's that, it, it's something that um, I work at. I work at it. Um, I work at not interrupting. Uh, I work at silence, being comfortable with silence in conversations um, and emptying my mind when people are talking and not being prepared for what I'm going to say when they stop. Um, so I work at it and continue to work at it. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that, you know, that's, that's my thing. And, um, uh, and so I would, you know, if, if you're interested, I check out the Ted talk on how to be a happy employee or something like that. And, uh, you'll see this little piece in the middle on listening. If, if it's something that you'd like to work on, uh, I, I've got some tips in there for you. And what I have found is that the great thing about being a great listener is that, um, yeah, it takes work, but boy, do you get rewarded because you're on point with your people. Absolutely. Uh, you're just on point with your people and people get, um, most people's experience is that other people don't listen. They wait so for their when, turn to talk. That's it. <laughs> that's it. And so when you're a great listener, you know what people say? You're a great listener. And that's just because it's so unusual for them. And when people are experiencing something unusual, unusual, they say a lot more than they plan. They become more vulnerable. Um, and so then the magic happens in terms of innovation. The magic happens in terms of innovation. So because when, when that happens, um, both people are feeling really safe. And uh, on top of that safety, great things happen. That is great advice. I'm going to run out and listen to this TED Talk as soon as we uh, get off this podcast here. 
Uh, Michael, it's been my pleasure to have you on. So happy that you took the time to come on the show. If the audience wants to get a hold of you, how can they find you? Yeah, LinkedIn's the best place. Because uh, I'm, you know, certainly checking that out every day. Uh, we put out a lot of our research there. Today, we just launched our world's best list. Uh, so we got a, a lot of activity uh, uh, go going on today. Um, so I look forward to seeing you on, on LinkedIn. If, and if you want to just check out our research, it's all free. You can go to greatplacetowork.com and uh, look at our resources and um, download some things. We've got some reports on, you know, how companies do great in a recession. I would definitely recommend reading that one right now, um, looking into 2021. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you for tuning in. I hope that today's episode inspired you to become a purpose-driven leader in your career or your community. There's no doubt that when we lead with purpose, we can change lives. If you enjoyed today's show, I'd be grateful if you would take a moment to rate us on your preferred listening platform. To learn more about Branded Group's Be Better experience and how we provide industry-leading, on-demand facility maintenance, construction management, and special project implementation, visit us at www.branded-group.com. Be sure to follow us on social media, and you can also reach out to me directly on LinkedIn. Until next time, be better.